Holy Mass opened with these famous words from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Gaudete in Domino Semper. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Indeed, we should rejoice for the Lord is nigh. And that the Lord is nigh is the central theme of today's liturgy. As the Church's celebration of the Lord's Nativity draws closer, she is at pains to emphasize why joy should brim in our hearts. The one and entirely absorbing reason is that the redemption of our fallen race has come with this most beloved child of Bethlehem. And what is more, the gladness of heart urged upon us is not a boisterous and superficial affectation. It is that gladsome serenity of soul which is the companion of holy peace. That being something that Americans are in deep need of at this time. St. Paul bases Christian joy on the assurance of salvation which has come to us through Jesus Christ, and he desires it to be so firmly established in the soul of believers that no reason of human anxiety or sadness should ever overcome it, since the great peace of God must henceforth predominate every other feeling. Let your modesty be known to all men, so he says, that is to say, let your mind and manner, your tongue, your Christian motivation show others this great hope which you place in the coming of Christ in time and into your hearts now by sanctifying grace. In the verses which immediately precede the epistle reading in today's Mass, St. Paul had reminded the Philippians as you know, we are citizens of heaven. He then made a plea to, to women, Evodia and Syntyche, to come to a mutual understanding in the Lord. Though what the disagreement of these first two biblical church ladies might have been, we don't know. But St. Paul pleads with the faithful of Philippi to help them to reconcile their differences. He continues by saying, let your magnanimity be manifest to everyone. To, to express that sort of kindness requires a genuine moderation, unfeigned humility, true forbearance, a willingness to waive one's rights. In Paul's mind, magnanimity, which can also be understood as kindness towards others, outwardly signifies and reveals what we inwardly believe, namely that we are citizens of heaven and that we are each awaiting in divine hope for the coming of our Redeemer. And since we have been so called, we are therefore to live together in one mind, in one undivided faith, and that with hearts filled with gratitude. These, then, are the signs of an authentic Christian spirit, spiritual joy arising from the hope we place in our Redeemer and the virtues we practice as fruits of the grace of Christ's advent among us. Yet for St. Paul, this coming of the Lord is not so much his birth in Bethlehem as his final coming in judgment. And the great joy of Christians is to see the day drawing nigh when the Lord will come again in glory to lead them definitively into his kingdom. And so the oft-repeated veni, come, O come, of Advent is therefore not only an echo of the prophets, but most especially an echoing of the conclusion of God's revelation to St. John, come, Lord Jesus, these being the last words of the written record of the New Testament. <coughs> Today's gradual, that is to say the psalm between the epistle and the gospel reading, interjects a note of solemnity. It is the, <coughs> and, uh, Sunday's gospel, which is the completion of the account which began last week. 
Thou, O Lord, that sittest upon the cherubim, stir up thy might and come. This is an allusion to the Ark of the Covenant, which guided the Hebrews through the lines of their enemies. Inappropriately, the church takes up their old battle cry, Rouse out your power, O Lord, and come. And this reminds us immediately, immediately of the opening phrase of the collects for the past three Sundays. They have each called upon God to bestir himself to come and to save us. But the gradual chant also forebodes hostility, for the enemy of God is also among us, prowling about, seeking the ruin of our souls. And this vein is continued in the Gospel proclamation, opening with the evil intrigues of the Pharisees in Jerusalem. How different is their question from that of last Sunday, put by the disciples of St. John? Are you he who is to come? They asked Jesus. While today the Jews questioned John with curt contempt, who are you? John, for his part, bears out Jesus' commendation of his humility. He states that he is simply the unnamed and unknown messenger sent by God to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah had foretold. He then quoted the text of Isaiah, in which the prophet describes the arrival of the Messiah as that of an oriental monarch. In those days, I tell you this each year that I preach on this gospel, in those days <clears throat> when uh, uh, such a monarch was to visit a neighboring uh, ruler, heralds were sent to call workers to smooth the desert surface, preparing a straight way on which the royal visitor could walk, that being because there were no roads. <clears throat> John was the fulfillment of this prophecy he was calling on the people to remove the rubble and stumbling blocks of sin, that is to the, say, the moral ruin in their hearts, thus readying them for the arrival of the Messiah. The mountains of pride are to be brought low, the valleys of avarice and gluttony and various forms of sins are to be filled in with grace to receive He who is to come. Now shining through John's words, we see that lo that love of truth which made him humble. The Jews, on the other hand, were not so much seeking the true Messiah as one of their own desire and making, and hence John, no reed swayed by the wind, told them fearlessly, I am a herald's voice in the desert, make the Lord's way straight. But they retorted, Who gave you the right to baptize? For that was an act of formal initiation and required divine permission. I am not the ruler of a new religion, implies John. I am only baptizing with water. In fact, he was saying that his baptism was nothing more than an act of penance, and it is penance that is needed to please God and to prepare his way into our hearts. So even now he, the Redeemer, is here, says John, one among you whom you do not recognize, and alas, they would not recognize. You ignore him because you are blind with pride, jealousy, and worldly desires. He is speaking to the Pharisees. As for myself, he says, I am not worthy so much to unfasten the lace of his sins. Try to understand what I am saying. Try to learn humility. And you too, Pharisees, even you can learn the truth. Well, despite his virtual virtue and exceptional holiness, and in fact due to it, the very one whom God chose to walk in the spirit of Elias, his herald, effaces himself. The Baptist did not wish to claim for himself a title that he did not own. He desired to remain unknown and with
without importance. Everything should shrink into the background before the only one of importance, and that being the long-awaited Messiah, him for whom our hearts, one and all, must be made ready by straightening the paths of our crooked lives. And how this will be done, the great father of the church, Gregory the Great, teaches us in a sermon he gave on today's gospel. The way of the Lord to the heart is made straight when his words of truth are received with humility. And the way of the Lord to the heart is made straight when our life is lived in harmony with his precepts. Hence, it was written, if anyone loved me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Whosoever therefore lifts up his heart in pride, whosoever burns with a fever of avarice, whosoever soils himself with the defilement of lust, he could have added, he so ever who promotes abortion and all the moral evils of our times while laying claim to being a Christian, closes the gates of his heart against the entrance of truth. And, lest the Lord gain entrance, he then fastens the gates with the locks of evil habits." Unquote. Well, it is a very far cry from Bethany behind, beyond the Jordan to Charlestown here in West Virginia. And 20 centuries separate us from today's gospel account. All the same, it was something that was real and took place. But the voice of Christ's herald rings out sharp and clear across land and sea and down through the centuries of time he says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Prepare ye for God's judgment, because he is coming again. It is true he is coming to us in the liturgical commemoration of Christmas, but he is coming to judge the living and the dead. The higher we are in politics or in the church, and the more faithless we are to his revelation, the more severe will be the judgment that falls upon our heads. Let us do, therefore, precisely this in the modesty of true Christian virtue, by putting off the old man and taking up the armor of life, by putting off the politics of liberalism, secularism in anything except for the revelation of our Lord Jesus. <clears throat> we should put on his armor, which is the armor of light, light, and we should rejoice in the advent of God's kingdom of grace and glory, which comes to us now in time. I preached on Libitum yesterday about the Blessed Virgin and her apparitions at Guadalupe. Seven million, seven million Catholic Christians left the Catholic Church in the 1520s and 30s. And so Our Lady appeared to a nobody in the middle of a country that had been a bloodbath of human sacrifice. And she said, are you not in the folds of my arms? That was something that Huatl Indians could understand. They couldn't understand the avarice of certain of the Spanish conquistador soldiers so mad for gold that the Indians thought they ate it. But they were humble enough to recognize in this mother whose image appeared on the tilma of this little Indian man who was, as I said, absolutely nobody, and seven million pagans, infidels, entered into the Catholic Church and her communion because they recognized in this mother and in this image and the crosses on their ships coming over the horizon, which were so fearful 
to their leaders because of their own pagan histories, in her, their humility found the ability to be touched by God. Seven million left in Europe, filled with arrogance and pride at knowing better than Catholic revelation in the church, and seven million recognizing the truth and beauty of this image came in. What does this say? We are going to be judged by God, not according to the high degree of our philosophical and political ideologies, most of which, or many of which, are against God and the natural law and the Ten Commandments and everything else, made worse by so many of them being themselves Catholics or Christians and people who should know better. We will be judged on our submission to God and our humility before Him. We don't need another bloodbath of human sacrifice made politically possible by a Catholic who publicly espouses the most monstrous ideas contrary to God and human life. What we need in our political leaders is precisely what John calls us to do on this Sunday. In the spirit of Paul, we should rejoice in his coming and not be fearful. And this coming is now by grace, but soon enough it will be in judgment. Thus this season for all of us should be marked by prayer and penance, the more readily straightening the crooked ways of our hearts, of our politics, our economics, everything, to the reception of him who will come in grace in our Christmas celebrations and judgments, either at the end of our lives or when he will come indeed to judge the entirety of the human race. Beloved, in worthily receiving him now, we will have nothing to fear when he comes at the end of time, in judgment and in God's all-consuming glory. Please rise. Credo in unum Deum, Patrem omnipotentem, Factor et Cere et Cere, 